send me that slide. I'm sure that's going to be very popular when I post it on our company Slack later today, if you have a chance. Absolutely. Uh, yeah, my name is uh, Henry Monka. Monka kind of rhymes with uh, Tonka, like a Tonky truck, or uh, oh, Willy Wonka at the chocolate factory. And, and Henry, you're the CEO of Posit Science and Brain HQ. Um, before we jump in and we get to know you a little bit better, I um, we got we got Bernie on your logo there, but um, I'm really uh, charged up and surprised that um, Tom Brady uses Brain HQ. So uh, one thing that a few people don't know, you know, <laughs> Tom originally being from New England uh, was good friends with Bernie, and here's a uh, here's a picture of him uh, sitting there on the bench with uh, with. <laughs> So uh, I'll send you both of those memes and hopefully uh, you and your team can get a kick out of it. Uh, but um, really well. I'm really psyched to jump into this discussion with you today, Henry. And uh, but before we dive into, you know, uh, the topics, um, tell us a little bit about yourself and Posit Science and kind of your career path that led you to, to leading this organization. Yeah, well, it's uh, it's really fun for me to join you in this conversation, and I know that you are sort of a DC metropolitan area based organization. I grew up right around you, actually, and in better times, I, I might be with you and giving this talk in person, I suppose. I grew up in uh, Chevy Chase, uh, DC, on the northwest side of DC there. Oh, so great. Yeah, now, where are you based now? Where are you now? Uh, we're out in San Francisco. So, you know, my career path is I uh, ended up going to college in Texas and then graduate school out here at the University of California, San Francisco. And uh, San Francisco is a kind of nice city. So a lot of people who come out here for school end up staying one way or the other. I spent a couple of years after doing my PhD in neuroscience, I um, spent a couple of years working for McKinsey and Company, the management consulting firm, where I did uh, healthcare work in medical devices and pharmaceuticals and biotechs. And then I also spent a bunch of time doing video game work and helped McKinsey lead its first studies in the video game industry. So a year or two later, when my PhD advisor called me up and he said, you know, all that science we were doing to help improve the brain health of rats and monkeys, we're actually going to combine that with video games and we're going to make uh, brain training exercises that can rewire the brain and help improve cognitive performance. I thought, well, all of my interests are coming together, healthcare, brain science and video games. <laughs> And so, uh, you know, I lived in San Francisco long enough that it was time to get my ticket punched and join a startup. So I, I, uh, I joined Posit Science at its inception. And have oh, been wow. Here. Now, what, when was Posit Science uh, founded? We were founded in 2003. So we've been at this for a little while now. And I, I've always looked at, like, I never even heard the term brain training before Posit Science. I'm sure somebody was doing it. But um, I've always looked at your organization as the pioneer in this space. Well, that's very kind of you. And, uh, and, and that is why we founded the company. You know, my PhD advisor, Dr. Michael Mersnick, had been studying the idea of brain plasticity and brain rewiring for his entire career. Um, he um, helped invent the cochlear implant and cure deafness. And it was through that work that he realized that, hey, it's, it's true that adult brains can rewire themselves. And so, you know, Posit Science was his vision of getting that science out of the lab and into the hands of people that it could help. And um, it's, it is fair to say uh, that we were really the first company to start doing this in a really scientific evidence-based way. We were the first company to run large-scale multi-site randomized controlled trials showing that our program has really worked and, you know, really have tried to kind of set the standard for what evidence-based brain training should look like. Great. Now, I think one of the things that I'm super excited and I'm using super because he's going to the Super Bowl. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Super, when I when I saw that it, it was actually we've had you booked for several weeks, and <laughs> I saw a news item uh, about Tom Brady using Brain HQ, and I was like, I can't believe I'm going to be talking to this guy on Tuesday. But it, <laughs> I'm I'm curious a little bit about that. But before we kind of jump into, I want to hear kind of how Tom Brady got connected with you guys, but. What I love, absolutely love about the fact that this elite professional athlete is using your platform is, is that so often the brain training gets stigmatized like a lot of the, 
the services that we provide to older adults is that, oh yeah, that's just for when you're trying to ward off Alzheimer's or what have you. And when we see undoubtedly the most elite athlete in modern times is using this platform that also people in assisted living communities are using, it's, it's a great thing. But uh, out of curiosity, is this an endorsement deal with Brady or how did you, how does he use um, Brain HQ? You know, it is a wild story. We're all kind of a bunch of lab, lab rats and science nerds at Posit Science, as you might expect. And so we were pretty surprised a few years ago when we got a call from uh, Tom Brady's um, training team. And they said, hey, did you know Tom Brady is using Brain HQ? And we said, uh, as a matter of fact, we did not know that Tom Brady was using Brain HQ. And the next thing uh, that happened is they asked us to fly out to Foxborough and, and meet with him and meet with his uh, cognitive health team. So the first amazing thing is that, uh, hey, Tom Brady had a cognitive health team. Uh, he was actually uh, doing uh, MRIs on a regular basis to look at his brain performance and work on improving it. And he had come across Brain HQ, him and his team all on his own. And when we talked to him, you know, what he said was, um, hey, I train every day to be in peak physical performance, right? And I realized one day that I needed to be training uh, above the neck as well, if I could put it that way. Uh, and, uh, you know, one story he told us was, um, you know, think about it this way. When I get the snap, I get the ball, uh, I have less than three seconds on the average to remember what play we're running, look at who I'm supposed to throw to, pick the one that's open, complete the throw. Because within three seconds on the average, uh, you know, my offensive line's going to break and I'm at risk of getting tackled. So I need my brain to be working fast and accurate. <laughs> And uh, it's kind of wild to hear him take the, the the science of what we had built for general brain health and really talk very explicitly about how it, how it, it helped him win games. And of course, if you're Tom Brady, that's what you're there to do. You're there to win. So super fun, fun for us to be involved in his organization, which is called TB12. And of course, how amazing it is that he's moved, of course, from the Pats to the Bucks, and is nonetheless, even after a move like that, doing what he does best and taking his team to the Super Bowl. Just incredible. Yeah, this is absolutely amazing. And, and uh, you know, yeah. you mentioned one of the things that I realized I wanted to follow up on, you know, when, I, when we founded Posit Science, uh, you know, there is kind of a stigma around this. There can be, and it's wrong. It makes no sense. When we founded Posit Science, one of the, my dad told me, oh, this is, this is for when you lose your marbles, right? And he had already had the idea that brain training meant that you had already maybe had dementia. And of course, that's, yeah, I love my dad, but that's crazy. <laughs> you know, we don't think about physical fitness that way, right? If you go for a run, nobody says, oh, you must be in terrible shape. Actually, people who are in really good shape like Tom Brady, go out and exercise. And I think that's really the corner we're turning with brain fitness is we're starting to think about this as something that should be a core part of our life throughout our lives, not just something that we, you know, use remediatively um, at, at, our, at our end of our life, so to speak. Yeah, no, this is great. Well, this was a great introduction. I don't want to delay because I know you've got lots of great info on, um, your program, uh, uh, some research on older drivers, and uh, and and what I'm before as I drop off the screen, I just want to remind everybody to let's make this interactive. So at any point during Henry's uh, presentation, feel free to type in the Q and A box the questions. And Henry, um, if you pause and a question comes in that's related to one of your slides, is it okay if I jump in? Yeah, and, uh, please do, please do. I might not be looking at you, so just start start talking until I stop. That's the best way to it. do it. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, super. Hey, with that really kind uh, introduction, um, it's really a thrill to come and uh, talk to all of you today. And uh, thanks for taking an hour out of your day to talk about brain health and um, and building better brains. And uh, yeah, I'm really going to talk about two things. Uh, I'm going to talk at first about um, just some ideas around some broad structured things that we can all do to take care of our brains and improve brain health really at any point in our life with maybe some particular emphasis for how the um, coronavirus crisis and the stay home orders are affecting our brain health. And then in the second part of the talk, I'm going to dig into one of those aspects in particular, which is brain training, because uh, as Steve has mentioned, of course, I work at a company that's built a brain training program. And I'm going to kind of talk you through the new science, the modern science of brain training and what it says about the brain and what it says about how uh, what we can all do to um, stay sharp throughout our lives. But, but let's start here. Uh, you know, 
in the chat window, I would love it if you could uh, write down and share with everyone who's here today, um, hey, what's one thing you've been doing to keep your brain healthy? And maybe particularly over the past, you know, eight or nine months during the coronavirus crisis where we've been stuck at home a lot more than we have used to have been. Uh, I'd love to hear it. I'll try and take a look at those about halfway through the talk and, uh, and hit on a few of them. But I think this is a time where just about everyone has started to think about keeping their brain more healthy. And uh, I'm going to talk about some ideas and I'm curious to see what people uh, out in the real world are doing like yourself. So yeah, they're, that, they're that coming in fast and curious. Uh, okay, fantastic. I can't see them right now, but I'll look at them and halfway through. And Steve, if you see some ones I should comment on, just call them out. Well, here, I'll just get, I'll just read a few of them right now. Uh, doing Great. puzzles, Duolingo, aerobic exercise, New York Times crossword, mindfulness training, reading a lot, exercise in Sudoku, by new, by new, by new, oh God, by neural beats. Um, oh, sure. Yeah. That's uh, a kind of auditory kind of brain training. That's long wild. walks in nature, keep learning new things, eat healthy, daily word puzzles. Wow. Watercolors. Lots of stuff. Okay. This is fantastic. I'm going to hit probably on most of those things and maybe I'll provide kind of a little bit more of a science lens to why some of those things are uh, are helpful. Although there's unfortunately one of them that I'm going to have to call out is maybe not as helpful as we'd like it to be. So, uh, hey, to think about keeping the brain healthy, we first have to understand, hey, what does the brain do? And I have to start here because a lot of the times when we think about the brain, we think about it in a very like ethereal psychological way, right? It's the soul, it's my consciousness, it's my experience of myself, and it lives in this very metaphysical domain. And um, hey, that is all great. Um, but as far as keeping it healthy is concerned, we have to think about the brain as a part of the body. It is a wet biological organ floating in some salt water inside of your skull, and it can be helped kept healthy by, you know, treating it the right way. But to understand what that is, we have to understand what it does. And, um, and let's start actually with an analogy in the heart, because that's an easy one. Uh, you know, probably just about everyone understands what the heart does, right? The job of the heart is to pump blood to deliver nutrients across the body. And, you know, we know a lot at this point about what keeps it healthy. We know that physical exercise contributes to heart health. We know that diet and nutrition contribute to heart health. But how about the brain? You know, what's the job of the brain? And when I ask this question, almost always people say thinking, right? Because that's our experience of our brain, we think. But, um, you know, that's probably not quite right. I'm going to phrase it a little bit differently as a neuroscientist or an evolutionary psychologist might think about it. The job of the brain just isn't to sit around and think like a philosopher. <laughs> uh, the job of the brain is to adapt our behavior to new circumstances. And what I mean by that is, you know, people are just remarkable animals, right? We can thrive almost anywhere on the planet. You know, there are people thriving in the deserts of Africa and Asia. There are people thriving, uh, you know, in the Arctic Circle. There are people who are thriving in the urban jungles of, let's say, San Francisco. Go. And the reason we can thrive as animals in so many very distinct locations is we have these incredibly fancy complex brains that enable us to change our behavior when we're in different circumstances, we can learn. And that's what the brain is really for. It is for learning and changing our behavior to help us survive. And so to talk about what keep it healthy, we have to understand that idea of brain change. And, you know, scientists' understanding of how the brain works has itself undergone an enormous change over the past 30 or 40 years now. You know, if you were to ask any scientist back in, let's say, 1970, um, hey, how does the brain work? Every one of them would have said the same thing. The brain is like a computer chip inside your head. It has these wires that connect to each other. They conduct electricity. It processes information. You know, that's what the brain is. It's a, it's a hardwired computer. And that led indirectly to some, you know, maybe unfortunate concepts about how the brain worked, one of which was, well, hey, it's going to wear out over time. And as it wears out over time, there's not a lot you're going to be able to do about it, right? Those wires are going to break and they can't be fixed. And, and that's certainly what I was taught in graduate school all the way through, let's say, uh, the mid-90s, which was, um, hey, the adult brain can't really be rewired. It just wears out over time. And, and if you take away one thing from this conversation today, I hope what you take away is that's absolutely not true. That's <laughs> nobody in neuroscience who thinks about the brain like a computer chip anymore. Uh, we now recognize the brain is a complex biological organ. And in fact, it is constantly rebuilding and rewiring itself in response to, well, what we ask it to do, our experience and our learning and what's happening in the world around it. And that happens when we're kids, that happens when we're young adults, that happens when we're older adults. 
And it happens when our brains are healthy. And frankly, it happens when our brains are not healthy as well. It is just how the brain works. It constantly rebuilds and rewires itself. And um, you know, scientists call this brain plasticity, and I'll probably use that term from time to time as I'm, I'm talking here. And really what we mean is the ability of the brain um, to undergo structural, functional, and chemical changes. And that's how we learn and remember things. So in fact, if you learn and remember that single one thing that I mentioned just a moment ago, it's because literally the sounds coming out of my mouth and traveling over satellites to Washington, DC uh, and entering your ear have literally rewired the connections in your brain to uh, help you remember what I'm saying today. And that's a pretty powerful idea. Um, and you know, it teaches us something about brain health because what we've come to understand is that when we have the idea of what is a healthy, resilient brain, well, what we mean by a healthy, resilient brain is a brain that's capable of change and ready to keep learning. If your brain's no longer able to learn or change, you pretty much by definition in a very unhealthy brain state. And, uh, you know, we've probably all heard the phrase, an old dog can't learn new tricks. And, you know, I'd say this idea of brain plasticity really helps us turn that idea on its head. And we might say now, um, hey, dogs get old once they stop learning new tricks. And all these aspects we're going to talk about of brain health are about helping keep a brain that's capable of learning new tricks and staying sharp and healthy. So I'm gonna talk about three, uh, six things, sorry, as we kick off here. And it's great, we have these in the chat because I think we've actually started to hit on just about every single one of these. Um, I'm gonna talk about uh, the role of physical exercise and movement as it's connected to brain health, talk about the role of a brain healthy diet, the role of good sleep, the role of social engagement with friends and family, the importance of maintaining good vision and good hearing. And then I'm going to talk about cognitive engagement and cognitive training. And then, like I said, I'm going to double down on cognitive training because it's, it's our area of specialty here at Positive Science. So let's start with physical exercise. And um, I think it's uh, you know increasingly well known, particularly maybe to the audience on this call today, that uh, physical exercise is good for brain health. But you know maybe it's important to still say, hey, why would that be? It's not obvious that that's the case, and it brings us back to the central point we mentioned at the beginning, which is uh, really important to remember that the brain is in fact part of the body. And if you're getting good physical exercise, well, one thing you're going to be doing is improving your heart health. And it turns out that everything that's good for the heart is good for the brain. And that's for a number of reasons. But one of them is that, um, hey, you know, it lowers your blood pressure and lowers your risk of stroke and heart attack. And all those things keep your brain healthy. It's probably true that high blood pressure gives slow accumulating brain damage over the course of a person's entire life, just from literally the pounding of the blood through brain tissue. And so lowering that and lowering that risk can help keep a brain healthier for longer. The second thing that physical exercise does is it helps you process blood sugar more efficiently. You know, the brain uses 40% of the energy that's used by the entire body with all that thinking and learning. And anything that helps uh, us, uh, us process glucose or blood sugar more efficiently uh, is going to help the brain stay healthier as well. And finally, there's very direct effects, particularly of aerobic exercise and releasing growth factors. You know, these are neurochemicals in the brain that are required to drive learning and sustain brain health. Uh, and it's quite clear from animal and, uh, and human models at this point that exercise just releases those growth factors and helps keep our brain healthy. So when people, you know, ask me for advice about this, you know, the first thing is, of course, we're all getting advice to exercise more. Um, and maybe the main point about brain health is it's one more really good reason that we or, you know, clients that you're working with can exercise more. If losing weight or having a healthier heart wasn't quite enough, maybe the idea of maintaining brain health will help uh, push a few people over the edge. Um, and of course, the key aspects to exercise are really setting a schedule. And, uh, and making it a habit. And even during the coronavirus crisis where we're all stuck inside more, you know, we're allowed to go out and walk regularly. And maybe if we're not commuting the way we used to to our work or our volunteer activities, we have a little bit more time to work this in. Uh, and in particular, during the coronavirus crisis, there are great online classes at this point from groups like Silver and Fit or Silver Sneakers or even just local gyms. Uh, and uh, of course, the big challenge with exercise is staying motivated. And, and um, you know, there's just kind of exciting things at this point around smartwatches and fitness trackers to really help people maintain a habit and track their progress over time. 
So all these things are important for brain health. The second thing I want to talk about is eating a brain healthy diet. And again, it might be a little bit of a surprise right off the bat that what you put in your mouth can change your brain. Uh, but of course, everything you put in your mouth ends up in your brain one way or the other after being digested and going through your, uh, your, your blood system and so forth. And so eating the same kind of healthy diet that's been shown to be helpful for heart health, you've probably heard of the Mediterranean diet, you know, focusing on fish and a glass of red wine and leafy green vegetables. Um, you know, this is, uh, is connected to uh, brain health as well, it's quite clear at this point. And then beyond that, it's more and more evident that there are key nutrients, um, things like vitamin E, chemicals called flavanols that are found in colorful fruits and vegetables, B vitamins, omega-3 fatty acids found in fish, all of these things seem to contribute to help protect brain cells against physical and chemical injury. Uh, and, um, you know, in terms of what you or your clients can do, um, you know, one of the first things is really about logging people's, your meals. I mean, this uh, helped change my eating habits a number of years ago. Just writing down what you eat makes it harder to eat that bag of potato chips in an afternoon, which is a good first step for brain health as well as physical health. And if you haven't come across it, it's very easy to look up the MIND diet, M-I-N-D diet shown here. And, and this is really uh, the current uh, scientific synthesis around um, foods that have been shown to be connected to cognitive health and brain health, uh, led by Martha Clara Morris, who uh, uh, did a, just a, a lifetime of research in this area. And there's wonderful sets of books and recipes and YouTube videos and all kinds of things about how to eat well. And you know, one of the things we advise people at Posit Science who ask us about this, and again, particularly while we're home during the coronavirus crisis, is you try to pick a few main meals a week, whether it's lunch or dinner, and make those a brain healthy meal. And you know, learning a new recipe is good for your brain as well from a learning perspective. And of course, eating in a brain healthy way is going to be helpful to people over time. The third thing I want to talk about is sleep. And of course, in America and probably many first world countries, we have just a crazy unhealthy culture of sleep, right? We believe that, um, uh, you know, we brag about getting four hours of sleep a night, right? You know, I only get four hours of sleep a night. I'm so productive. Uh, you know, how many times have I read about a, a top CEO who's getting up at uh, four in the morning and going to bed at, uh, you know, 1 a.m. and that's how he's uh, so successful. Uh, you know, students, right? I pulled two all-nighters to finish my work. And this is really all just absolutely terrible from a brain health perspective, it's worth saying. And, uh, you know, the reason we have that culture a little bit is because we believe that while we're asleep and we're unconscious, that we're not doing anything. In America, we feel like we should be doing things all the time. But, you know, as a neuroscientist, it's important for me to say that, well, we, your brain, in fact, is quite busy while you're sleeping. And it's doing two things in particular. The first is that it's consolidating memory. You know, your brain actually reviews everything you may have learned during the day, and it sort of lays those down into memory tracks. Scientists who studied rats learning mazes, you can actually record from the brain of the rat while she's learning the maze, and you can see the brain pattern of activity that's involved in learning. And then when that same rat is sleeping at night and you look at those brain recordings, it's like the rat is running the maze again, except at hyperspeed. And in fact, that's when the learning happens. If you interrupt that learning, you know, rats or for that matter, people don't actually experience any performance gains the next day. The second thing that the brain is doing is cleaning itself at night. Um, you know, as I mentioned, your brain is supported in this sort of salty fluid. And uh, hey, it just gets dirty during the day as a result of, uh, you know, metabolism and everything that your brain has to do. And at night, these waves pass through it that actually clean it out, which uh, let your brain start the next day fresh, so to speak. So sleep's important. And uh, and, you know, there's a lot of people who don't get great sleep and, and there's a whole uh, set of things, again, you can look up online around sleep hygiene training. And they're basically all lessons that, um, hey, sleep is a learned behavior. You have to train your brain to go to sleep at certain times. And if you do that, it's going to be easier to go to sleep. So for example, if you have a nighttime ritual, right? Maybe you're reading a magazine for 15 minutes. Maybe you have a glass of warm milk. This actually signals to your brain after you know a few weeks of getting accustomed to it that, hey, it's time to go to sleep. My brain should do that. It's important over a longer period of time to make a habit of going to bed at roughly the same time. And it doesn't really matter whether it's 8 p.m. or I should say 11 p.m. But you know, if you're bouncing around from night to night, your brain just isn't learning when nighttime is, so to speak. Uh, and, you know, for people who are still having challenges sleeping, there are some very nice evidence-based cognitive behavioral therapy apps at this point, things like Sleepio, for example, on the App Store, and, uh, and they can be helpful as well. A fourth thing I want to talk about is staying socially engaged. 
And uh, it just turns out to be very interesting from a brain science perspective that interacting with families, friends, neighbors, and even strangers is actually great brain exercise. It turns out that talking with people, listening to people, understanding what they mean, it actually challenges all these core cognitive abilities like attention, speed, memory, and, and even specialized parts of the brain that are involved in social cognition. And doing so actually activates attention and reward and novelty detection systems, which contribute to brain health as well. And of course, this has been particularly hard uh, over the coronavirus crisis. Uh, I haven't been back to see my parents in DC for six months now. Um, but, uh, you know, we can all do work to stay in touch with a family member, an old friend, or, or even a new one on the phone or on a Zoom call, or I think Steve, it was a great suggestion, meet some people on chat while you're on the webinar today. And, uh, you know, over the longer term, we can do things like arrange meetups. You know, my family's actually gotten together on a few big Zoom calls with people all over the country, which has been a great way to reconnect, or a socially distant walk, which is what my mom has been doing. And over the long term, it's really just important to think about combating social isolation for a lot of reasons, but one of them is a brain health reason. You know, we know that if people are socially isolated and lonely, it has negative effects on their brain health. And, um, you know, thinking about staying in touch with people, not just for the, for the fun of it, so to speak, but because it's really a health related activity is, is a good way to frame it. I also want to briefly mention the importance of maintaining good vision and good hearing in brain health. Um, you know, it turns out that as we get older, uh, our ears and our eyes uh, actually change in certain ways um, that they send lower quality information to the brain. You know, literally the hair cells in the ear start to uh, die off or break as we get older and the photoreceptors in our eye get less dense. And as a result of sending that lower quality information to the brain, you know, the brain actually, for, unfortunately, changes through plastic processes and becomes slower and less accurate as that worse information comes in. So one thing we can do uh, is we can add signal, right? Making sure that we have a correct prescription for glasses and contacts and uh, frankly, a proper hearing aid, even though that's not a thing most people are eager to go ahead and do, they really should be. Because you know, sending higher quality information to the brain actually trains the brain to become faster and more accurate. And so, uh, you know, things people can do right now is do an active vision or hearing check, you know, literally check when you're out walking in the world or driving, do you feel like you're aware quickly of things in your peripheral vision? Or do you feel like maybe things are sneaking up on you out of the corner of your eye? Do you feel like the TV has to be louder than it used to be in order for you to hear it well? Those are all signs that, you know, it's time to start thinking about um, changing your prescriptions. Um, my wife, uh, for example, uh, when I turned 50, uh, pointed out that I was holding my books an awfully long while away, away from me, and maybe it was time for reading glasses. And um, I had never had glasses before, but uh, but I finally went out and got them thanks to her. And I would say it you know, changed my life and probably has improved my brain health as well. The last thing I want to talk about, and then I'm going to dig into more detail on this topic in particular, is about training your brain. You know, everything I've talked about so far for brain health, you know, helps your brain health in an indirect way, you know, physical exercise, sleep, social engagement. Training your brain, of course, is something that can affect your brain in a very direct way. And, you know, as I mentioned at the beginning of this chat, it's just very clear at this point that new learning in particular rewires the structure, the function, and the chemistry of the brain. Uh, and in fact, it's becoming increasingly clear that training that's focused on the speed and accuracy of information processing is particularly effective at improving cognitive function and generating brain resilience. And, um, you know, what do I mean by speed and accuracy? So really what I mean by that is think about the difference between, let's say, um, oh, I don't know, learning ping pong and doing crossword puzzles. You know, if you play ping pong, um, your brain has to be fast and accurate. You have to see when the ball is coming. You have to decide what the right thing to do is quickly. You have to move your hand and you have to modulate the force at which you hit the ball back. All that requires an enormous amount of coordinated activity across your whole brain. That's quite different than, um, than crossword puzzles. And here's the part where the crossword puzzles people will, will, will wanna have my head on a pike. And I heard there was at least one of them. Um, hey, crossword puzzles are great. And if you love doing crossword puzzles, everyone should have hobbies they love. <laughs> uh, and uh, they don't all have to be about brain health. 
Um, but uh, a lot of people do come to me and say, hey, I'm doing a lot of crossword puzzles. Is this going to you know, save my bacon? Is this going to maintain my brain health? And, and there's really no evidence of that so far, I'm somewhat sad to say. You know, when we look at people of every age who like do a lot of crossword puzzles compared to those who don't, you know, it's definitely quite clear that people who do more crossword puzzles have higher cognitive function, but it's also quite clear that they decline at the same rate that people who don't do crossword puzzles. And what that tells us is, well, hey, smart people choose to do crossword puzzles, but the crossword puzzles themselves don't, you know, slow cognitive decline or improve it. And that's probably because crossword puzzles don't require your brain to be fast and accurate. You know, it, it feels like you're thinking, but, you know, you're mostly just kind of sitting there thinking. And, uh, you know, thinking itself doesn't make your brain faster and more accurate. It really requires doing things. Uh, and in fact, new learning as well as doing things. So if you've had a lifetime love of crossword puzzles, you know, maybe it's time to mix it up and try, uh, try some jigsaw puzzles or push yourself even further and see if there's a new board game that you can uh, talk someone into learning with you, whether it's in person or online. And that new learning combined with you know, speed and accuracy is what's gonna help your brain. Of course, the other thing that you can do, and we'll talk about this more in a moment, is train your brain uh, with a brain training program that works like Brain HQ, which I'll talk more about in a moment. So how do all this add up? And it's been pretty interesting over the past few years. Scientists have developed this concept of what they call cognitive reserve, which relates to the idea of brain resilience. And what scientists mean by that is all of the, we might think of the brain as a, you know, a bathtub, right? And we can fill it up with water, but it also leaks water or it drains water. And you know, the things that fill your brain with water, that fill it with reserve or resilience are all the healthy things we just talked about. Physical activity, brain healthy food, social engagement, getting good sleep, and of course, cognitive activity or cognitive training. Uh, but at the same time, your brain's leaking, right? Just getting older causes this reserve to leak out. If you've had a brain injury, you know, maybe you uh, fell off a motorcycle when you were a kid. Maybe you uh, fell down the stairs recently and hit your head. You know, maybe you eat a lot of brain healthy, unhealthy foods, or maybe you're experiencing loneliness or stress and anxiety or cognitive inactivity. All those things cause your brain reserve to leak out. And, and the way scientists think about this is we want these healthy activities to be contributing much faster or more than these unhealthy activities are causing our brain reserve to leak out. So, you know, we don't say, hey, you should never have fried chicken, even though it's probably a brain healthy, unhealthy food. We just say, hey, if you're having fried chicken on a regular basis, you know, you should make sure you're doing a lot of these healthy activities activities to compensate for that. We want to keep this brain full. And in fact, probably what happens is when these unhealthy activities, uh, you know, exceed the healthy activity on the healthy activities, that's when we go on to see things like uh, dementia and Alzheimer's disease. And in fact, it's very clear at this point from really hundreds of studies across each of these areas that changing our lifestyles, changing our behaviors in these ways can have significant effects on the, on the risk of dementia. You know, people who exercise more than people who don't have a 14% lower risk of dementia. People who are eating those healthier diets have a 33% lower risk of MCI, mild cognitive impairment, which is a pro-dementia condition or dementia itself. People who are engaged in high levels of social engagement see a 12% lower risk of dementia. People who, you know, maintain good vision and hearing with, you know, correct prescriptions and people who get hearing aids. Actually, um, you know, if you're nervous about getting a hearing aid, the best thing I can tell you is it will lower your risk of dementia. So you should go ahead and do that. People who are getting a good night's sleep have a 26% lower risk of cognitive impairment than people who are suffering from obstructed sleep or uh, sleep apnea and so forth, obstructed breathing. And people who are engaged in you know, cognitive activities their whole life actually have a 40% lower risk of dementia. And so this is to say that there really are things that all of us can do and that our clients can do to uh, change the potential outcome of their life. And um, no one's saying you have to do all of these, although they're all good, but people can look at this kind of menu and they can start to pick things to work on, right? Well, I'm not sleeping well. well okay, well, let's work on your sleep because that's an important part of brain health. Now, I'm very sedentary. Well, let's work on getting you out and about. That will be good for your brain health. You know, I'm not really stimulated very much. I've been sitting around and watching a lot of TV because I'm bored at home. Well, let's figure out some new activities to drive some new learning and maybe specifically some things that make your brain faster and more accurate. So with that, I'm gonna double down and talk just a bit more about cognitive training um, during our, our few minutes together here. And, um, you know, we've built a very specific cognitive training program with Brain HQ. It's, uh, you know, there's a million brain games. You open up your phone, you will literally find a million. Um, but um, 
Uh, we built something quite distinct for that. And the reason is because we have this deep understanding of the neuroscience of uh, brain plasticity and what happens as we get old. And as we get old, you know, our brains just get noisier. And that happens in the auditory domain and the visual domain. And, and one way you can actually kind of process this a little bit is um, we can all do this. If you grab your fingers, your thumb and your forefinger and put them on your Adam's apple, you know, if you make these sounds time and kind, time, time, you know, if you feel, and everyone should just do this, right? We're all at home, no one's gonna be embarrassed. Time. You know, when you make the tuss sound, you can feel your lips and your voice box start to open at the same time. Time. Uh, lips open and your voice box starts to vibrate, I should say. Now I make the sound kind, kind, kind. You'll feel that your lips open a little bit before your voice box starts to vibrate. There's actually a short pause in there. And that short pause is actually very brief, right? Just 20 to 40 milliseconds. And if your brain is processing information quickly and accurately, you'll hear that distinction. And that means you'll hear speech clearly and speech will get stored in your memory very clearly. But if your brain's getting older and slower, you might miss that rapid distinction. Speech is gonna sound murkier. It's gonna be harder to hear people talking quickly. It's gonna be harder to hear people talking in a noisy restaurant. And for that matter, it's gonna be harder to remember what people tell you. So that noise, that slowness in the brain is a problem for cognition. The same thing's true in vision, actually. There's been a well-studied phenomenon called the useful field of view, which refers to what's the space over which you're, you can take in information across your whole field of view. And it turns out that you know when we're young, we can see things across most of our field of view pretty quickly and accurately. But as we get older, on the average, that useful field of view shrinks. We are only taking in information across a very narrow range across the center of our vision. People said it's like looking at the world through a soda straw. And that's because of the same phenomenon around noise in the, in the aging visual system, because the brain gets noisier, particularly in peripheral vision, you know, it's unable to process information quickly and accurately there. Uh, and this has real world effects, right? We know that auto crash rates go up on the average as people get older. And in fact, the most dangerous kind of crash for older people is an intersection crash. And it's an intersection crash because people are looking at the world, well, this way, they don't notice something coming in out of the corner of their eye. But we can do something about this. You know, as I mentioned, the brain is plastic and it reorganizes itself. I think I'll go ahead to this slide and say, um, you know, scientists at UCSF in the lab I was in decided to try building a brain training program for rats. And uh, what they showed is that uh, we can improve the speed and accuracy of information processing in rat brains through training. So here's a young rat, here's an old rat, and here's an old rat who's been through brain training. You can see her, uh, her uh, mortarboard hat on top of her head. And you know what we're looking at here is we're looking at the auditory system of the rat brain. And uh, each of these little colored polygons represents a part of the auditory cortex, which is processing sound. And the blues and the greens represent areas that process sound precisely, quickly and accurately. And the reds and the oranges represent regions that process sound noisily, by which I mean almost any sound that comes in activates this area in red and orange. And that doesn't give the rat a lot of precise information around what's going on in the world. And as rats get older, you know, we see more red and orange. Their hearing is noisier and less accurately, just like, uh, just like it is with people. This is a rat who, if she was out at a fine dining restaurant, would have a hard time hearing what her partner was talking to her about. But if this rat goes through brain training, we get these remarkable improvements in speed and accuracy of information processing. In fact, the old trained rat looks slightly sharper and faster than the young rat was to start with. So we can drive those kinds of changes. We can take noise out of the system. And, and over here, I'll just say briefly, this has real effects on brain health as well. You know, these red dots you're seeing here are a certain kind of neuron in the brain and they start to go away as the rat gets older, but they actually come back after the rat goes through brain training. And over here, the red we see is insulation called myeling that actually covers brain cells to help them communicate electrically. And this also starts to go away as rats get older, but we can rebuild it to some extent through brain training. So the right kind of brain training can change information processing and change brain health. And, you know, long story short, as I mentioned, my PhD advisor called me up and said, hey, we've helped a lot of rats and monkeys get healthy brains. <laughs> Let's help some people do it. And so we built this brain training program called Brain HQ. 
It's got more than two dozen exercises. They all focus on speed and accuracy of information processing. They're all adaptive, so they find the right level of difficulty. They're all designed to generalize to real world benefits. They're all designed to improve things like attention and reward and novelty. They're involved in uh, how the brain gets engaged with learning. <clears throat> we end up with tremendous amount of data as people go through them. So we know, you know, if a person's doing well uh, and they should move on to an X exercise, we know if they're doing not so well and they should return to an exercise and train more. And, you know, we can sequence these exercises so people go through the right uh, pattern of brain training on these different exercises to improve their cognitive function. And, um, you know, as I mentioned, uh, hey, they work. <laughs> And you don't just have to take my word for it, because uh, there's a million people out there saying they built brain games that work. We actually went out, as I mentioned to Steve, and did the first large scale randomized controlled trials to show that a, a cognitive training program like this could improve cognitive performance. So here we're looking at a study that, uh, that we did with the Mayo Clinic and University of Southern California. And we actually enrolled nearly 500 people over the age of 65, and half of them got randomized and did Brain HQ. The other half of them did a control activity where they watched and learned from educational DVDs, um, like, you know, Carl Sagan's Cosmos or Sister Wendy's History of Art. So things that, you know, trained the brain, but not made it faster and accurate. And we saw something pretty amazing. So green is the Brain HQ group, and on the left is their scores before training, and the right is their scores after training. And this is just a measure of how fast the brain is, with lower scores being better. And we see that we can make the brain much, much faster. And people who went through about eight weeks of brain training, we you know, almost doubled their brain speed. Whereas people who watched educational DVD-ROMs, they may have learned something about the history of the universe, but they didn't make their brains faster. And then we could ask the question, this generalized to memory, did we improve their memory scores? Well, it turns out the answer is yes. This is an IQ-like scale. The average person would get 100. And people in the brain training group actually improved their uh, memory scores by about four points here, with really only about one point of change in the DVD-ROM. So four times larger memory gains by making the brain faster and more accurate. And on the right, we also just did questionnaires about everyday cognition. You know, on a scale of one to five, can you hear well in a noisy restaurant? Can you remember the names of people that you meet when you're out and about at parties? Lower scores are better. And again, saw this beautiful improvement in the brain training group and really no change or slight worsening in the control group. So we made their brains faster, that improved their memory and the effects were bigger, big enough to notice in the real world. And then further work's been done by folks uh, funded by the NIH. This is data from the active study. It's an extremely large study uh, of more than 2,800 older adults. And the NIH was kind enough to fund the study to follow them for 10 years to really get a sense of what the longitudinal effects of brain training were. Uh, and this compared to uh, speed training, which is now part of Brain HQ. There were actually two other training programs, classroom memory training and classroom reasoning training. And there was a control group as well. I'm just showing the data for speed in the control group for the make this not overwhelming. But you know, we see that uh, this is again a measure of speed with lower scores better and the folks who did the speed training, they got much, much faster compared to the control group. And in fact, those benefits were maintained even 10 years later, right? It starts to wear off because they're not doing brain training over this whole time. But even 10 years later, they're faster than they were at baseline. And then had real world effects. This is a measure called instrumental activities of daily living, which are, you know, can you cook and clean and dress so that you can stay living in your own home? And in the first few years, both the groups show not much change, but after about three years, the control group starts to, just, to um, experience pretty rapid losses, whereas the folks that did brain training are going down, but not as fast. And in fact, there's about three years of protection as a result of going through the brain training program. And you know, there were real world effects as well. This is a measure of at fault car crashes, literally recorded from the Department of Motor Vehicles. And you can see that you know, the control group has about a three and a half percent chance a year of having an at fault crash. And the folks who went through this um, speed and accuracy brain training that's in Brain HQ actually cut that risk in, at risk in half. Probably because if you remember back to that picture I showed, um, their peripheral vision was faster and more accurate. They could just take in more of the world and stay safe. And those benefits seem like they speak to um, a risk of dementia. So, you know, here's our control group in purple that had about 11% or a 10.8% risk of dementia uh, over the 10 years following the start of the study. I haven't showed the data for the memory and the reasoning training in the previous graphs, but I'll show it here. Um, you know, the people who did the memory training in the first year and then people who got some booster training in the third year, they showed about the same risk of dementia, no significant difference. 
but folks who did the speed training and particularly folks who did the speed training and then did booster training in the third year showed a much lower risk of dementia. Really the first evidence, and, and I should emphasize more is required, but really the first evidence that uh, improving brain function in this way might protect people against the risk of going on to dementia. Uh, and I think I will skip these next two in the, in the interest of time and just go on to say, um, you know, hey, that data was from people who are 65 and older. And that's, of course, where we got started, because that's who we thought we could help with this kind of brain training. But as time has gone on, as we talked about a little bit at the beginning, it turns out that brain training is probably like physical exercise. No one would say, don't bother getting any physical exercise till you turn 70. That's the time to start. Everyone would say, hey, you should have physical exercise your whole life, right? And then when you get to 70, you'll be in pretty good shape. Good for you. Almost certainly the same thing is true with brain training. And now with Brain HQ, we're starting to see this because we're working with a lot of different populations. Uh, we've just started some work actually with uh, uh, folks in the uh, military, in particular Marine Special Forces down at Camp Lejeune, who are using Brain HQ to uh, take uh, people who are well, really sharp to start with because these are Marine Special Operators. They are the best of the best. Uh, and they're using Brain HQ to take them from the 95th percentile, one might say, to the 99th percentile so they can go out there and win wars. Uh, we're working, as I mentioned at the beginning, with Tom Brady, but also quite a number of, uh, of other professional athletes as well. And I think Steve asked about this. I'm not sure I answered the question. These are not paid endorsements. You know, I, I can't afford to pay Tom Brady to endorse us. You know, these are athletes who have come to us because they are putting Brain HQ as part of the tools that they're using to keep care of their brains and their bodies to win more games. Uh, we're doing some work now with um, knowledge workers, really at every stage of their career. We did a, a great study with um, Fujitsu in Japan and um, uh, showed that we can improve uh, speed and accuracy of information and actually change brain activation patterns measured with electroencephalography in uh, middle-aged knowledge workers. You know, their brains are plastic too. Uh, we work with senior communities uh, all across the country and of course many, many people who we would just call healthy aging, people who are want to you know, maintain their sharpness. And then we've started to do work now with people who are in uh, what you'd call a pre-dementia condition or mild cognitive impairment. The Mayo Clinic uses uh, Brain HQ as part of their habit program for people who've been recently diagnosed with, um, with MCI. And again, you know, I think what that speaks to is, hey, we're undergoing this revolution in brain health where we realize that this is pretty much for everyone at every point in their life. And again, you don't just have to take my word for it again. Um, there's really been a sea change over the past three or four years. You know, we're going from a time where, as Steve mentioned, no one had heard of brain training to a point now where the National Academy of Sciences, Engineering and Medicine issued a report saying, hey, what are the things you should do if you wanna be proactive about your brain health? And they said, hey, there are three things that you know, merit your attention. You should uh, maintain uh, your correct blood pressure. Uh, for the reasons we talked about in heart health. You should engage in physical exercise, the reasons we talked about, and you should do an evidence-based cognitive training program. The data they had actually was from Brain HQ studies. The Alzheimer's Association wrote a review that said, hey, it's great to study these things uh, and we should always fund more research, but hey, the science is in and it's time to put these things to work and take action. The American Academy of Neurology and their updated guidelines for taking care of people with memory disorders like mild cognitive impairment actually said, hey, first of all, stop prescribing these people Alzheimer's drugs, they don't work. And second of all, you should be prescribing them, well, physical exercise and cognitive training. So incredible sea change from neurologists. Even the World Health Organization issued guidelines last year on uh, brain health and aging and said that uh, cognitive training should be used to help maintain cognitive performance in older people. There have been great reviews that have come out. I can't resist putting this quote in because it's so nice to us. This was a group that looked at every uh, cognitive training program developed for older people and found that really only positive science had um, you know, multiple studies that met the standards for uh, gold standards uh, clinical trials. And even the NIH, when they were reviewing this field, pointed out that positive science training drives improvements that are significantly better than other types of cognitive exercise. So the field is really happening. And uh, here's where I'll stop. I'll just get up on my soapbox for a moment and say, um, hey, there's just this enormous change. And we've been through a change like this already with regard to heart health. Uh, you know, my mom, um, when she was a teenager, her mom passed away, um, probably due to congestive heart failure, right? Her heart wasn't working. The doctors couldn't do a lot for it. And, uh, and then she passed away. 
Um, but over the past 50 years, we've made incredible progress in heart health. We know about the role of diet and nutrition and exercise. We have new drugs. We have new medical devices. We have surgeries. So when my own mom had some heart problems a few years ago, she got instantly diagnosed and she got a pacemaker. And three months later, she was walking up and down the hills of San Francisco with her grandkids. That's what 50 years of progress means in heart health. And we're just now at the beginning of that for brain health, right? We are now at the point where over the next 5, 10, 15 years, you know, these kinds of things are going to be integrated into how we think about taking care of our brains um, throughout our lives. And we're going to look back at this time and we're going to think it was nuts that we let people get old and just, you know, watch some TV and relax because they had earned it. We're going to think that was the dumbest thing ever. We're going to think that it was crazy that we let service members come back from the war after multiple exposures of concussion and exposures to IEDs and just told them, hey, go back to work or go back to school, you'll be fine. We're going to think that's nuts. We had to take care of their brains. We're going to think it was silly that we had people who had severe mental illnesses like depression or schizophrenia, and you know we just treated them with drugs rather than treating them with drugs and programs that were designed to rewire their brains. So um, I hope that this, uh, when you think about this and keep this in mind over the next few years, you're going to see these changes happening and you're going to realize you were a part of it by starting to think about the things that we talked about in this webinar. So I'll stop there, Steve. And uh, I haven't looked at the questions or the comments at all. <laughs> Maybe yeah, there's a few well, things I yeah, yeah, This is great. And um, I, uh, lots of good, uh, good, good questions and comments, but let me jump in with a few here. Uh, let's see, EJ Burroughs says, how do you encourage people who like to isolate themselves and not to socialize to be more active? As some adults get older, they become stubborn and don't want to get out, move, and socialize. Um, and and again, we're all into breaking the stigma of aging on these discussions. And I've had this conversation with multiple people, and they'll say, "My dad is so stubborn. He's he's an old man. He's stubborn, and he doesn't like to do anything." And I say, uh, "What was he like when he was younger?" Oh yeah, he was stubborn then too. Um, so. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Not to say yeah. that they can't make somebody stubborn or contribute to it, but uh, but what is your thoughts? I mean, I think we're we're yeah. all wired different, and I sort of um, that is absolutely true. And um, there's been some really nice research around this, right? So it's easy to just think, oh, I just need to tell, you know, my dad or my uncle or my client to get out more and I'll tell them about all the benefits of making friends. You know, why doesn't that work? And there's been some very nice research around this area. And one of the things that the research has pointed out is, you know, we really need to get one level underneath that. You know, what are the obstacles that a person might have um, to, um, to, getting, to getting out more? And one of them is stubbornness, like you said. But it turns out that in many cases, there are some different ones. People are nervous, right, about, um, social environments and making new friends. All of us are nervous a bit, right? Probably all of us remember a first day of school where we wondered if the uh, other kids were gonna be mean to us, right? Those worries don't go away. They're there for kindergartners and they're there for people who are moving into assisted living. And so, you know, working with a person and working with their environment to, you know, highlight that worry and then take active steps around, hey, how can you sit down at a lunch table the first day you're in a, in a senior community, right? What are some topics of conversations you might make with a young person when you're out volunteering? You know, putting tools in people's hands can be helpful because I think sometimes that stubbornness comes from nervousness, not just pure stubbornness. The other thing that came out in that research is, um, Hey, and these are particular older people, older people, uh, you know, they may feel like, hey, I, I'm not hearing that well, so I don't want to go out and volunteer. I'm not going to be able to hear what the people are talking about. And, you know, hearing aid can help with that. And, uh, older people can be worried about incontinence, right? I'm going to be embarrassed. I can't really be somewhere for two hours. And really listening to the whole person and understanding those issues, you know, I think can start to help to address it. It's a naughty problem, right? I'm not, I'm not here to make light of it. But, you know, really listening and understanding those obstacles, I think, is a huge part of it yeah Great. no absolutely um let's see uh, we got some more questions here martha cooper states some slowing is brain slowing in vision but some is junk in the eyeball i guess <laughs> yeah like what you were just talking about cataracts can dramatically isolate somebody socially and um as is hearing issues as well yeah, that's absolutely true. In fact, when I started graduate school, my grandmother had um, 
uh, macular degeneration. And whenever I talked to her, she would say, you need to work on macular degeneration. <laughs> and uh, sadly, I disappointed her. I worked on brain plasticity instead. Um, but they do relate to each other and not just macular degeneration, but all of these issues in the eyeball. You know, we can't fix the eyeball itself with brain training, unfortunately. But what we can do is we can train the brain to take better advantage of the information that the eye is able to present, right? The brain does not necessarily take 100% advantage of everything the eye is sending it. And particularly as we get older, like you say, as there's more junk in the eye, you know, the brain itself, unfortunately, could adapt to that by getting slower and less accurate. So maybe your eye is sending 80% of the information and your brain's only taking advantage of half of that. Well, it's at least, least change the part we can change, which is brain information processing. So that, uh, you know, even if that junk is starting to float around in your eye, you can still notice things in the corner of your vision quickly and accurately or take a good advantage as you can of, of what your eye can still do. No, great. Uh, and tons of uh, requests. Would you be willing to share this PowerPoint? Um, yeah, yeah, I'd be happy to, Steve. I'll send it on to you. And, uh, you know, if you like, um, my uh, science colleagues at Posit, we actually took a number of these uh, thoughts around those broad issues around brain health, and we wrote a uh, PDF booklet. Um, oh, and I'm happy yeah, to if you send me both you. of those, I'll, yeah, I'll yeah. get it out to everybody who attended. Um, let's Thanks. see. Ellen Whitehead White Whitehead um, says, what is your opinion on multimodal brain training interventions such as the one in the finger study? Oh, uh, that's a great question. So for people who, um, uh, uh, I should say to amplify that question, the finger study is this very uh, interesting study done by um, a group up in Finland. And uh, what's meant by multimodal there is that the intervention they used for brain health was a combination of brain training exercises, uh, a Nordic diet, sort of heavy on fish and, and certain kinds of vegetables, uh, and then physical exercise. And what they showed over a two year period was that combination of things uh, improved cognitive function in, uh, in these older adults and actually kept them, kept them healthier on the whole. Uh, compared to a control activity that just did uh, health education like brochures and so forth. And I think that's opened a lot of interest to saying, hey, if brain training is good and exercise is good and diet is good, you know, wouldn't all of these things, you know, mixed together, so to speak, be even better? And um, yeah, we agree completely. In fact, the Alzheimer's Association here in the United States has funded a U.S. version of the Finnish finger study uh, because Americans don't eat like Finns, right? There's only so much pickled herring we're going to eat in the winter. And so, um, and so they've adapted that diet for U.S. diets, still making it brain healthy. And uh, so that study is running right now. And uh, Brain HQ is actually the brain training intervention that that study, which is called U.S. Pointer, is using. So we're a big believer in combinations like that. And I think if you look at other health activities, you know, there may be people on the line who are familiar with the Diabetes Prevention Program, which is a community-based health intervention around diet and exercise to help people lower their risk of diabetes. And I think there's a huge opportunity for that in brain health as well. I think in the future, we're going to see community-based programs that involve brain training and physical exercise and diet and sleep and social contact and all the things we talked about that are going to be community-based ways at your public library or church or the YMCA that uh, we're going to be bringing these brain health activities out to people. Great question. Um, got a few more questions here. And whenever I say that, then five more come in, but I'm hoping that we can wrap things up here. Um, Ann Ritchie says, I found out about GSU because of you, so thank you very much. Did you reference GSU in your slide deck? What, what is GSU? I would have to ask Ann what she's referring to, and I'm sure as soon as she tells us, and if she can in the Q&A, that would be great. I will okay. slap my head and say, of course. Okay. <laughs> but I, I have to confess, I, the acronym is not connecting with me right off the bat. <laughs> um, okay, so, and then Joan Green, so Ann, type that in if you wouldn't mind. Oh, it's, oh, she was talking about me. It's <laughs> called um, so get, get makes set me feel up. a little better, Steve. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Um, get set up is an amazing platform that we profiled here that offers um, free classes uh, and some paid classes online, but they're they're moderated by older adults and they're designed for older adults. Oh, and um, 
and it, yes, the isolation and the engagement, it's a, it's a great solution. Th thanks for that. Uh, Joan Green says, can you speak to the ability of individuals who engage in Brain HQ if they have hearing, vision, and dexterity issues? Also, how much into play is tolerance for frustration? I think yeah. we kind of addressed some of those well, in our early you know, Yeah, I will say this. I mean, um, uh, you know, even with mild hearing loss, people can do the hearing exercises. Even with mild vision loss, they can do the vision exercises. If a person is profoundly deaf, they could not do any hearing exercises and focus on the vision exercises. You know, as far as dexterity, you know, it is required to be able to use an iPad, for example. And if a person is having motor difficulty sufficient, they can't use an iPad, you know, without a doubt, that's going to become more, more, more challenging and they might need someone to help them do it. And as far as the frustration, you know, what I'd say is that, you know, training is a kind of learning. Um, and I think all of us know that, hey, the brain does need to be, I don't want to say frustrated, but it does need to be challenged in order to learn. And I think some people go into brain training with the wrong idea. They think it's a test and they want to get them all right. And if they don't get them all right, they feel like they failed. And um, hey, that's a very tough framework, right? We have to reset that framework. If you are gonna learn anything, you are going to get it wrong sometimes, right? That's part of how the brain learns. And you need to have a, 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 a viewpoint around that that says it's not about getting them right or wrong, it's around having the right related challenge and seeing my improvement. And so when we have people who are frustrating, frustrated, we spend a lot of time kind of on cognitive reframing, if I can put it that way. Um, okay, great. Got three more, and uh, actually, uh, I'm surprised it took so long for, for somebody to bring this up, but thank you to EJ Burroughs. Uh, what does this cost? Is it a mobile app? And are these services offered in the, um, the Washington, Baltimore metro region? You know, I'm a little bit embarrassed I didn't say this already because I meant to. Uh, anyone who'd like to try BrainHQ out, just send us a note at support at brainhq.com. You should be able to see that on your screen. And uh, hey, our customer delight team will just send you an activation code so you can try out the full version of BrainHQ. So thank you for spending an hour with me and Steve today. We'd be happy to just put it in your hand to try out. So um, is it uh is it is there a cost associated with yeah, it? Yeah. So if people just come and buy it on their own, you know, you can get a year subscription to Brain HQ for 96 bucks, so eight bucks a month. So it costs money because we have to pay the engineers and keep the lights on, but we're trying to make it a, a reasonable expense, not like a giant healthcare expense. Um, we also do make this available to groups like senior communities and hospitals and rehab centers and things of that nature where we can set up a group license where you can actually monitor and you know, support the people in your group who are using BrainHQ. Uh, and uh, the other part is that uh, BrainHQ is available from a number of public libraries, um, actually at no cost at all to library patrons. I should have looked at the DC area, so I don't know one off the top of my head, but check with your public library. You might be able to check out BrainHQ just like you check out an electronic book. Okay, and um, okay, so, so uh, Karen is just, following up on that. So if people email support at Brain HQ, they'll get it free of charge for a trial period. Yeah, we'll send you a whole one. And then, you know, outside of just meeting me personally on the webinar, and again, thanks to everyone. You know, if you have a friend who wants to try it out, you can actually register at Brain HQ. Just go to www.brainhq.com. Um, and anyone can register for free. It will actually give you one exercise a day to kind of try it out over time and see if it's of interest to you. Okay, and is it, Ruth asks, is it a mobile app or is there a, a multiple? Yeah, yeah. It's, you know, you can do it on the web at www.brainhq.com or you can download it on your, from your app store, right? If you have an iPhone, an iPad, if you have an Android phone or an Android tablet, just go to your app store and search for BrainHQ and you will find it. Are there non, uh, like for somebody who's not digital, is there a way to engage with this? Yeah, you know, that came up. We work with a number of Medicare Advantage plans and uh, one of them asked us about that. And that's actually why we wrote the book that I'll send on to you, Steve, or the booklet, I should say. It's not, not a whole book, but a booklet. And, you know, that booklet contains a lot of, in more depth, the content that I talked about at the beginning of my talk. And so BrainHQ itself is a digital thing 
because you know we have to adapt to the challenge of the exercises and present very specific sounds and very specific things to see. So there's no workbook or something for Brain HQ. But I would say if a person really is not able to or really doesn't want to engage in a digital platform, you know, some of the things we talked about earlier, you know, can you pick a hobby that involves training your speed and attention? Uh, you know, work on learning a new language, pick up an old musical instrument. You know, work on your ping pong. You know, these are all things that, you know, in their own way, engage the brain in a similar way that Brain HQ does, although maybe not quite as intensively. Great, great. Yeah, I mean, I think this discussion, th there's lots of different, like, I think the thing that you've reiterated is, while you obviously, you know, want the world to flock to Brain HQ, the, it's, it's important to understand that there's lots of different paths that uh, people can take and I think that came through with your talk is, is that it's just looking at the brain the same way that we look at, before we talked about this, it was sort of going to a health club, you know, and, uh, That's and, exactly and right. quite honestly, and I see that, uh, that my friend Mike Harrigan is on this call, like he has a uh, program that combines fitness and brain training together. So, um, uh, yeah, that sounds fantastic. You know, I, we founded Positive Science because we want everyone to have a healthy brain. We built Brain HQ because that was a great tool to do it. But as we, you know, mentioned in this talk, that's really the important thing is to think about all the things you can do to take care of where your brain yeah, is. You know, that's great. Point in your life. Okay, and I, to address every question there, I'm cutting this off at this last one. It's from Sarah Rhodes who says, "How often are you supposed to brain train, and how long for each episode?" Yeah, that's a great question. It turns out brain trainings, um, you know, the studies that have been done, uh, you know, they typically involve somewhere between two hours to as many as five hours of brain training per week. And, uh, you know, we see benefits after as few as, um, you know, five or, five or six weeks of training. And a couple of important things about that, you know, it's not like this is something you have to do every single day, you know, like exercise, if you exercise three or four days a week, you know, you're doing pretty well and brain exercise works the same way. And then second of all, it's not like a drug. You know, if you stop because you get busy, you have friends in town, you're going on a trip, you know, you can stop your brain training for a while, won't wear off immediately. You should come back to it eventually, just like physical exercise. But again, it's more about um, making sustainable changes to your life in terms of how you engage in cognitive activity. So great question. All right, well, that's it. And I, you see, I brought Bernie back up on the screen for your, uh, he's, he's everywhere these days. And, uh, well, Henry, this has been fantastic. Uh, look forward to future discussions. Definitely keep us posted uh, on any new developments that that come around the bend. And uh, uh, I know I know there's somebody, some people in the audience that are rooting against your client Tom Brady uh, in the <laughs> Super Bowl, but. The fact that he's using Brain HQ just makes me root for uh, Tampa Bay even more uh, for this. <laughs> well, you know, I, the way I look at it is I know, Tom, some people love him and some people hate him. So uh, you should root for your own team to start engaging in some good brain training. And maybe they'll be at the Super Bowl next year. How about that? <laughs> I love it. Holy cow. <laughs> so, uh, all right, folks. Well, I'll, I'll try to get this recording uh, up there and... Uh, Henry, send me your your PowerPoint and the brochure, oh. and we will follow up with everybody as soon as possible. Fantastic. Steve, thanks so much for having me today. And again, thanks to everyone for joining. Great questions. Okay. Bye-bye.